pick up where we left off last week, and it has been quite a journey as we have just watched the Lord work uh, in the land of Egypt to deliver and rescue uh, his people. Uh, Tonight, we come to the final plague uh, in Egypt. Had a bit of a brief interlude last Wednesday night uh, as the Lord prepared his people to go. Uh, So last Wednesday, we saw the institution of the Passover feast. Uh, the institution of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, and what that meant. And, and, and God just wanted to make sure when this night and this moment comes that his people are prepared, that they are ready to go. And so at this point, as we come to this portion of chapter 12, uh, the Egyptians have been warned. Uh, Pharaoh has been told this is what's going to happen. Uh, God's people are prepared. And so we're going to see uh, the beginning of the exodus uh, tonight uh, as God miraculously delivers his people. Let's just ask the Lord's blessing on our time in his word and we'll dig in together this evening. Father, we are thankful once again for the privilege we have of gathering in your house. We thank you for your word. Lord, it is living and it's powerful. Uh, Lord, it's able to speak to our hearts, uh, to cut deep within, uh, to meet us right where we're at. And Lord, you know what we need tonight. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit and your word would work in our, in our lives, in our hearts, that uh, you would uh, accomplish the purpose that you have. So we ask your blessing on this time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I want you to think a little bit as we enter into this section. Uh, think about a time in your life when, uh, when you know the Lord was watching over you. A time when you can remember, uh, you know, God just... He demonstrated his power and his protection in your life. Um, I I can think of numerous uh, different, I'm sure you can as well, uh, different times in my life where it was just evident that God's hand was watching over me. Uh, And I remember as a a young boy, uh, there was about four or five boys in the neighborhood. I was probably, I don't know, 10, 11 years old. And we were building a tree house back in the woods behind our house. And... uh, it, it was probably literally about it was probably about three stories high tree house it was it was it was six stories high tree house level but probably about three stories high. I was way up in the in the air and I remember I was up on the top level and I was nailing a board on and and, and the board that I was standing on gave way and and, and so when, when that board gave way I just went down <laughs> and I hit I hit the next level and I hit the next level and I hit the next level and I went all the way to the ground um, and, and I remember when I got to the ground, I was just laying in a pile of boards and nails. And I mean, it was just two by fours everywhere and there were nails everywhere. And, I'm, and I was laying here after falling, I'm, I'm guessing about 20 feet. I, I should have broke something. <laughs> I, I, I should have had holes in me. And I'm laying here in the middle of all this and I didn't have a scratch. I mean, I was and, and I, 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 I was before I came to know the Lord. I didn't I didn't. I, yeah, I, I, it could have killed me. And, I, and now I look back on that moment, and I think, man, God was miraculously watching over me that day. And, and I imagine you have moments like, I can think of different you know, times through my life where it's just like, it, there's no other explanation than that God was watching over me at that moment. And, and, and more than that, I think back on my, you know, my life, just I didn't grow up in a Christian home. You know, I, there, there's no, we didn't read the Bible, we didn't go to church, but I see how God sovereignly worked and moved to bring me to a place of saving faith. And I I just look and I see God's hand at work, his watch and his care over my life to bring me to a place where I was safe from his wrath and and, and by his grace. And and so I I look back over my life and I could just see the the ways in which God has moved and orchestrated. I I mention that because at the very end of our the passage we're going to look at tonight, down in verse 42, it says it was a night of watching by the Lord. To bring them out of the land of Egypt. Uh, And so we have a a picture here of God watching over his people. right, Making sure that they are safely delivered out of bondage, out of slavery, out out of Egypt. Once and for all, God is watching over. And, and, and it's not, a, it's not a just a sit back and kind of monitoring. Right? We know that God is going to involve himself intimately. But it's a good reminder of God's personal care for his people. God watches over and cares for and, and works in ways to meet the needs of his people. And, 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 and sometimes he demonstrates his, his power and, and, his, and, and, and 
and his presence in ways that are absolutely miraculous. And so we see that tonight. In fact, right at the outset, you know, we're going to see God's, God demonstrate his power in delivering his people. And, and, and God promised, this is what's going to be necessary to set you free. Think back with me to Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus 3.19, it says, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. God said from the beginning at the burning bush, Moses, Pharaoh is going to let you go, but it's going to take a demonstration of my power. I'm going to do all my works. I'm going to use all my might, and then Pharaoh will let you go. And that's where we're at. We're at this point in this story where God has time and time again shown that he is the one true God. And Pharaoh has continued to rebel and dig his heels in and say, no, I will not let this people go. And we come here to verse 29 and we see the final plague unfold. It says, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Right? So this is the, the last, the final plague, the Passover. The death angel is going to come in and take the life of the firstborn of every child in Egypt. And we, we hear that, and, and we almost cringe, and we think, man, that's not right. That's not fair. That's, that's such a harsh judgment. But we don't want to forget that, that this is a people who have wickedly rebelled against the one true God. This is, this is a people who for hundreds of years now have, have murdered and killed God's people, right? As they were born, they were immediately putting babies to death, and they were trying with everything they could to work their slaves to death. And now God is delivering his people, uh, and he's doing it in a way that is just and is right. And, and again, we hear that. And, and it, it almost, it, it seems like it's not fair, but then we remember that God, the God of all the earth, does that which is right. He always does what is right. And, and we see the extent of the judgment, right? It, you, you can't miss it. It goes from the palace all the way to the pit. The, the, the man with the highest authority and, and the one who is the lowest in the, in the kingdom of Egypt, all of them are going to face this judgment. And it's a good reminder to us tonight that, that no one escapes the righteous wrath of God. It, 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 there are those who feel like they are they're above that, right? Because of their power, because of their authority, because of their influence, they almost feel as if they're untouchable. Well, if Pharaoh, if Pharaoh can be touched by God's judgment, then anyone can be touched. There was nobody who ever had more authority and more power than Pharaoh of Egypt. And yet, this judgment and this plague strikes his house. And, and, and there are those who maybe feel like, you know what, this life and this world has treated me unfairly, unkindly. I don't deserve anything else. I've got everything that's been coming to me, and now all I deserve is good. And the truth is this. Everyone deserves God's wrath, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the judgment of God. And, and as we look at this account take place, we're reminded that what? There's a people who avoid this judgment, right? The, the Israelites were given instructions. If you take and sacrifice the, the, the lamb and you put the blood on the doorpost, when the angel passes by, he'll see the blood and he'll pass over your home. And, and so it, it's, it's, again, a, a good picture for us that the only way to escape the judgment and the wrath of God is what? Is through the blood. Right? And, and it points forward to the work of Jesus Christ. If we're to escape the judgment that we rightly deserve, it's only going to come through faith and obedience. And that, and that, that was the picture that we see here. Not one of the Hebrew homes are affected by this plague. Every Every single Israelite escapes the judgment, not because they're better than the Egyptians, because they're not, but because of God's grace and because of their faith in God's provision. And, and that's the difference. And, and you can imagine the effect that this has on the land. When you come to verse 30, it says Pharaoh 
rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. The, the, you can just you can feel the weight of the tragedy that takes place in Egypt that night. Not a single house was spared. You, we, we, can, we can grab a hold of the, what, it, what it is to lose just a child. The cries in Egypt that night would have been heard for miles. No, you know, no one slept that night. Pharaoh himself is up. He's mourning the loss of his own son and mourning the loss of, of, of people throughout his land. And the cries of the Egyptians here are meant to echo back. And, and they should be a reminder. And it, it, it says here that their cries, you know, <laughs> it says there was a great cry in Egypt. Back in chapter 3 again, when, when God first came to Moses at the burning bush, it says, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, I know their suffering. Right? The, the cry, the, the, that, that's the same word that's used here, the cry that goes out in Egypt. And it's just a reminder that what, what God's people have experienced in Egypt has been pain and suffering and hurt. And God has heard their cry. And God has moved to rescue and, and deliver his people. Uh, I can't help but see that word at the response of God's judgment, the weeping and the wailing, and not think of the response that will be for the judgment of God in the days to come. Like God promised in his word there will be those that are weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, those who reject Jesus Christ, those who do not put their trust in him will experience the full weight of God's wrath. And there's nothing, there's nothing left. There's nothing left but sorrow, hurt, and pain. And so we see a picture of God's power, but also a reminder of God's righteous judgment and the significance that, that, that goes, <laughs> it's, 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 there's no one who escapes the judgment of God. And, and so you be sure, be sure tonight, without a doubt, that you are in Christ <laughs> and that you are safe and secure from the wrath of God. Well, we see not only God's power, but we see that God is faithful to his promise. And, and we see there in verse 31, it says, Then he summoned Pharaoh, summoned Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Right? So, middle of the night, get Moses, get Aaron, bring them here. And, and in the past, this is not new, right? When, when, when a plague would come to Egypt, Pharaoh would often say, what? Get Moses, right? We want this to stop. We want it to end. But it was usually a back and forth negotiation. Right? If, you, if you will make this stop, then I'll do this. And who do you want to take? And what? There's no negotiations here, right? Yeah, there's no Moses saying, let my people go. It's Pharaoh saying, get your people out. Right? Get out of here. We don't want to see you any more and, and it's, it's a powerful picture of what God has promised. In chapter 6 of, of, of Exodus, in verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, You shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. It's not just that Pharaoh let the people go. He made them go, <laughs> right? God did such a work in Pharaoh and in Egypt that he said, We don't want you here anymore. You've got to go. And, and, and that, that took a long, you know, it was a long process, but it, it came to that point where we see the power of God, the sovereignty of God over the heart of men, right? The, the heart of the Lord, or the, the hand of the Lord turns the heart of the king. And, and that is so true here. In this instance, God has said, here's what's going to happen, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exercise my might and my power, and Pharaoh is going to force you out of the land. And so we see in verse 32, take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. also. <laughs> Moses, everything you ask for is yours. Just go. Right? In the past, <laughs> in the past, Pharaoh said what? No, what I say is what goes. And now he says, just as you have said, that's what, that's what I want. Whatever, whatever you want, just take it and go. And, and by the way, would you pray for me? 
would you bless me? Right? Remember that the nation is in ruins. But there's no blessing offered back. Right? Moses doesn't turn back and say, yeah, I'll pray for you. There's, Pharaoh is going to reap the consequences of his sin and his actions. You know, Egypt's gonna, it's going to take years and years for Egypt to recover from what has unfolded. And so we see, a, again, a picture of the faithfulness of God to his promise. And then a reminder, you know, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right? Here we have a recognition by Pharaoh that yes, yes, this Lord, this Jehovah is the one true God. Now, it's short-lived. It's not genuine repentance, right? Because it's not going to be very long before he turns and chases them down. But in this moment, this rebellious, hard-hearted man kneels down and says, I, I, I understand. I recognize. Go and do as the Lord has said. <laughs> man, God is powerful in the hearts and lives of men. So we see in verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks and on their, their shoulders. So it wasn't just Pharaoh, but all of, all of the Egyptians felt the same way. Get out of here. Right? If you stay, nothing's going to be left. We're all, we're all dead. And they recognized that the power of Jehovah, the, they, God has so clearly demonstrated to them that their gods are worthless and they have no power they just they want them gone right? they feel threatened they feel and this is what this is what you call the fear of the lord right that this is a clear recognition of the wrath and the judgment of god and the egyptians are saying please go and don't 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 wait and, and, and the the hebrews are ready they have their their unleavened bread that god told them to have they obeyed and they just bind it up and they're they're gone, just like that. But as they go, look again. We see a, a picture of God's promise. Verse 35, the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. This is, again, God, God said this is how it was going to unfold. But who pictures that? You, you are slaves in Egypt. For 400 years, you have toiled and labored for nothing. And now, on your way out, they're just going to throw their gold and their silver at you? Why would they do that? This is God's hand at work again. And God said this is what would happen. Back in chapter 3, again around the burning bush, as he's sending Moses to Egypt, in verse 21, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go... You shall not go empty. Each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry, for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. Now, we've already looked at that a little bit and just seen you know, God's power and God's provision and what that means for the Israelites in the future. But again, we see how trustworthy his word is. What God has said, he will do. Right? That his word never fails. Now, brothers and sisters, that is, that's a good reminder for us tonight. This book that you hold in your hand is true. And, and the promises that you, you find within it are trustworthy. That you, can, you can hang on to those and you don't have to let them go. And, and so there's a, there's a rock that we can stand on that we have when, when, when God says he will do something. He'll do it, even when it's, it's absolutely crazy, right? Yes, those slaves in Egypt, when they leave, they're going to throw their silver and their gold at you as you go. That's insane, and yet that's exactly what happened. God is in complete control, and, and he's how firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, we have in his excellent word. Now, what we see here as, as you know, this kind of picture of giving up their gold and their silver, it says at the very end of verse 36, they plundered the Egyptians. You know, that's a word that's used of a, of a conquering army. Now, the, the Hebrews didn't do anything. Right? They didn't conquer anyone. But Jehovah God, he absolutely obliterated Pharaoh and his gods and his wise men and his magicians. Right? 
And all that's left is everybody just standing in awe of this God. It, it's, it's a complete and total victory. And, and so it's, it's a good reminder, again, for us tonight. God does not just deliver us from our enemies. God defeats them completely. You know, th- this is a picture not only of, 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 of their deliverance, but of our deliverance. Think with me just for a moment of what happened. What happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross? He didn't just deliver you from your sin. He defeated your enemy. He conquered, right? Romans chapter 6, listen to verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer be enslaved to sin. So we're delivered, set free from sin, no longer in bondage. But it's more than that. When Jesus died on the cross, you remember the promise that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden? The, uh, from the seed of the woman, the, 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 the head of the serpent will be crushed. That is complete and total victory. Right? Not only Satan, but sin and death itself is conquered through the work of Jesus. Again, in Romans 6 and verse 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, right? This victory has been won. We are no longer enslaved, no longer in bondage. We weren't just set free But we were given total and complete victory. So that in verse 14, he says, sin will no longer have dominion over you. No longer. You have been set free from sin and death. Now, when I hear that, I don't know about you, but I think, she's fine. She's not bothering anybody. (laughs) I think, what's wrong with me? I still sin, right? I've been set free from sin. I'm delivered. I have victory over it. And yet, I'm still going back to that old sin. So that doesn't make sense. Well, if we look back, we're no different than the Egyptians are, are we? we? They were given complete and total victory. They were set free out of Egypt. They're going out into the wilderness. But it's not very long before what? Before they're fashioning a golden calf. They're worshiping the gods of Egypt before they're longing for the life that they had in Egypt, right? They're starting to, man, I wish I could have the vegetables that we had in Egypt. Man, I wish I had this. Man, I wish we had that. And they start looking back on the life they had in Egypt and longing for that. We're not so different. We've been set free from sin, delivered from that, from that bondage. And what has God done? He's given us total victory, and yet we're still running back, still going back. It's Tish's fault. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but aren't we so much like that? Like, we've been set free. We've been given victory over sin, and yet we still run back to it. And, 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 and the thing is, is that God's still working, right? When he set them free and he delivered them, he gave them complete victory. And yet he still, he got them out of Egypt, but he still had to get Egypt out of them. So there's a process that's going to take place, right? It's going to unfold in the wilderness. God's going to work and he's going to change and transform his people. So that's what he's doing with us, right? We, he set us free. We have complete and total victory. But this sanctification process is ongoing. He's still working. He's still, <laughs> that's an old song, right? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Right? That, that's what's happening, right? We're, we're still being changed, still being transformed. One day, we're going to see him face to face, and when we see him, we'll be like him. And the victory that we have in Christ will be fully realized. It's kind of an already and not yet uh, that we experience as his people. And so we see that pictured here with the deliverance from Egypt. Complete and total victory. They've been set free, and yet they still run back to that same old Egypt, and we still run back to those same old sins, and God is working to change us. He's faithful not only to his promises, but he's faithful to his people. Notice verse 37. 
the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Now, Succoth was actually, or I'm sorry, Ramses was actually a city that they built. You go back to chapter 1, and the Egyptian slaves are the ones who constructed these supply cities. And so they're, they're, as they're leaving Egypt, they go through this city that they built. They go off to Succoth, which is, it means a city of booths or a city of tents. Right? So you've got 600 men plus women and children who are now going to wander through this tent city. I don't know how, right? I mean, how do you accommodate? If you just stop and think about it for a moment, 600,000 plus women and children, we're talking about approximately 2 million people leaving Egypt that night. It, it would have been almost unimaginable to have this people walk into your city, uh, let alone try and provide and take care of and meet the needs. God is going to miraculously meet the needs of his people as they leave Egypt. But it's a, it's a reminder to us once more of God's faithfulness. Remember, when back in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 15, God promised Abraham that they were going, he, he, he was going to have a nation. Right? Uh, his, he, they, when they entered Egypt, what did they have? 70 people when they came into Egypt. I mean, that's a big family reunion, but it's not a nation. Right? I mean, that now, as they're leaving Egypt, 2 million. We have a nation as they're leaving the land of Egypt and going towards the promised land. God has fulfilled the promise that he gave to Abraham all those years ago. The thing that stands out to me is while they were enslaved and while they were in bondage, God was keeping his promise. It would have been very easy to look back and think, man, God forgot about us. You know, he's he's you know, all those promises that he gave. But, you know, and, and it, you see God's sovereign hand at the enemy did everything they could to wipe them out. They killed their babies. They tried, to, they, they tried to work them to death. I mean, they did everything they could to wipe the people out, and yet they multiplied, right? And, and multiplied to the point that when they leave, they're a great nation. They have 600,000 men. That's, that's probably armed soldiers ready to go. God has fulfilled his promise through the trial. You know, we were meeting for a small group. Last night, we were looking at the book of James, and we're going to read through that together. But you, you, you're right there at the very beginning. You know, it says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? That the, the testing of your, first, your, your faith produces patience. And when patience has its perfect work, <laughs> you're complete, right? And so we're reminded that you know, through the trial, God is working still. Right? And, and we see that pictured so vividly here. It would have been very easy for them to think, man, God has forgot all about us. But God didn't forget his promise. He didn't forget his people. He continued to do exactly what he said from the very beginning in bringing about his purpose. In verse 39, it says, they baked unleavened cakes of the dough they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now, why in the world do we stop and talk about bread right now? <laughs> that seems odd, doesn't it? I mean, this is an incredible night when there's so many things that you could think about and talk about. When you think about God's miraculous power and deliverance and what's happening with the, you know, with the Egyptians and what's happening with the Hebrews. And he says, they baked unleavened cakes. <laughs> and, and the reason it's brought up here is, is it's simply a reminder. Number one, a reminder of their sovereign, you know, their, their sudden departure. But it's a reminder of God's deliverance. It's symbolic of what he has done. This is, the, this is the, um, the memorial that God gave his people for them to do every year. Right? They're going to have the feast of unleavened bread where they're going to remember God in such a miraculous way set us free from Egypt that we had to leave so quickly <laughs> that, that we, we couldn't even allow the, the bread time to rise. We had to have unleavened bread. And they're going to remember that forever and ever. So it's a symbol of, of God's salvation that's brought up here. And it, not just theirs, but ours. Right? We, we know that Jesus identified himself as the, the bread of life. Right? The unleavened bread, leaven representing sin. Jesus, the perfect, sinless lamb of God. Right? And, and so we find 
in Christ's life. And so this picture of unleavened bread, again, points us forward to God's sovereign deliverance over sin. And we see there in verse 40, the time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And that just takes us back again to the promise that God made to Abraham. You know, God promised him a nation, check. But he also said, right, you're going to go into this land of Egypt and you're going to be in bondage and you're going to be there for four generations, 400 years, you're going to suffer until I judge the nation that oppresses you. So this was all part of God's plan. God had purpose for his people to be in bondage and be in slavery in Egypt and then to set them free. So we see again and again and again, God's word is true. His word is faithful. Now, I, I just want to caution you. Sometimes uh, people will look at this 430 years and, and they'll say, well, that's just evidence that God's word contradicts itself. Because some places it says 430 years. Some places it says four generations. Other places it'll say 400 years. And so, you know, they'll, they'll just say, you know, God's word doesn't match up. And we see that in the New Testament. Stephen's talking back on this time. And he'll say exactly 430 years. And Paul will say 400 years. And it's not a contradiction at all. We do that, right? We, we all the time, we, we, we round down, we round up. Right? I mean, that's all they're doing. Right? When it says 400 years, it's just a general reference to how long. When it says 430 years, it's an exact, right? And, and we can tell it's an exact reference here because he says to the day, right? To the day, 430 years. On that very day, the Lord of hosts went out from the land of Egypt. And so this is no contradiction. This is just the way we work with numbers all the time. Right? Sometimes we generalize, sometimes we're exact. And that's all that's happening here. But we see again and again and again, the Lord never forgets his people and he never forgets his promises. And, and that is something we can grab a hold of and hang on to. The very last verse there in 42, we kind of referenced at the beginning. It was the night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is the night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. How do we respond to God's deliverance, to his rescue, and to his victory? You know, if, you, if you have a KJV there, it almost seems like it's a doubling up, a parallel. It, kind of, it says you know, it was a night of observing to the Lord and observing to the Lord. But you know, the SV, I think, captures the essence of it here. The Lord was watching. Right? The Lord was watching. The Lord was I making sure that his people were delivered, they were set free. And then in response to that, this night is to be a night of watching to the Lord from now on. So what he's saying is from now on, because of, because of the deliverance, because I watched out for you, I now want you to look to me. Right? Does that make sense? From this point forward, because of my salvation, the proper response to a God who watched out for us is to look to him, to watch and wait for him. For the Israelites, that was just an annual feast, right? They would, on this night, they would have the Passover, they would celebrate, and they would remember, and then they would, you know, year after year, they were supposed to look and watch to the Lord, remembering what he had done. You know, we don't have the, we don't celebrate the Passover today, but our response is still the same, right? We're still, right, we can, we can stop and recognize, yes, God has watched over me, not just physically, but spiritually he has delivered us set us free given us victory but can we wait for him can we watch for him you know can watching is hard isn't it waiting is hard because we don't know what god is going to do and we don't know how long it's going to be you know for for the israelites praying and crying out for 400 years for god to deliver and set them free Sometimes we have situations and circumstances we're in and we, God's saying what? Wait on the Lord. Watch. Watch. Look to the Lord. And, and we can sit back and we go, oh man, it's hard. It's hard to wait. It's hard to be patient. And, and here's the answer to, to how we do that. Right? We, may not know who, we may not know how long. We may not know how. But we know what he can do. Right? We've experienced that. And so for the people of Israel now, as they leave Egypt, they have to be thinking what? If God is for me, who can be against me? Right? The, and we can say the same thing. This God who did not spare his own son, how shall he not graciously give me all things? 
We don't know what he's going to do, and we don't know when he's going to do it, but we do know what he's capable of. He, he is able to do above and beyond what we ask or think. Now, we have a God who has demonstrated his power in our lives, who's kept his promises. And so at, in those times where we're waiting and we're watching, we can be certain. We can be certain that God is going to work according to his plan and his purpose. That doesn't mean it's our plan and our purpose, but he's going to work according to his plan. And we know that he can do <laughs> great and mighty things for his glory. Good reminder tonight. I would say this just in closing, and I, I, I pray you, I pray you know, I pray you know without a doubt that you are safe from the judgment of God. Uh, if there's any uncertainty in your heart, in your mind, about whether you are saved and secure and, and, and safe from God's wrath, then please see me tonight before you leave. I'd love to talk to you more about what the word of God has to say to that. For the rest of you, for those of you know him, you know him, oh, look to him, watch for him, wait for him. It, it, it's, it's a marvelous thing to watch God work. Let's close in prayer.